Today, to the second in the PAPI series on uh, thinking the politics of race. Uh, we're delighted that you managed to come despite our various difficulties in getting the message that this was happening out to you without our dear old friend, Uni Info. Um, so we're delighted, actually, before I introduce today's speaker, two quick announcements uh, about upcoming events. Uh, next week, same time, same place, we have the third talk in the series with uh, John Narayan from the University of Warwick coming to speak to us. And this Thursday, uh, in which room? In G7 Pavilion Parade, Zayn Masri will be doing a talk that is rather wonderfully titled The Hot Third World in the Cultural Cold War, Arab Art, Modernism and US Intervention. So please come along to both of those events. Um, and as for today, I'm delighted that we've got uh, Kahinda Andrews coming to speak to us today. Kahinda is an Associate Professor in Sociology at Birmingham City University, uh, where he was instrumental in setting up the UK's first Black Studies degree. He's co-chair of the Black Studies Association. He wrote a book in 2013 on resisting racism, race inequality, and the black supplementary school movement. And he's currently working on a project on the role of black radicalism in contemporary um, activism against racial oppression. Uh, and I believe his talk is coming out of that research today. So without further ado, can we welcome Kahinda Andrews? Um, all right, so uh, thank you. Thank you for coming up the yellow stairs, which is a really weird experience. Um, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the book, uh, which is called Black Radicalism, and it's out in July. Next July, you can pre-order it as well, if you want. <laughs> Go to Amazon if you know. So I talk about the book Black Radicalism, and really, so it's really trying to say, what's the point of this work? I try and put it in a bit of context around black studies, probably. But I guess there's a difference between black studies on the one hand and black radicalism on the other. <coughs> Actually, one of the things in the book, uh, which I am going to probably get a little bit of trouble for, is the point of the book really takes Malcolm X, and you'll hear me say Malcolm X a lot today. I love Malcolm X, so it's mostly Malcolm X. In fact, in the book itself, there's about 246 pages. Uh, I, 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 I search, so you don't find on page uh, Malcolm X. It was 236 times in the book. So just to give you a context, there's a lot of Malcolm X, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, and there's a quote by Malcolm which really framed why I wanted to do the book in the first place. And Malcolm basically says, the word revolutionary is being misused. And people really don't understand it. And if they really understood the word revolutionary, they would take it out of their vocabulary. Right? And actually, this is the point of the work on black radicalism and the point of the work on radicalism in general is to say that we had lost the meaning of radicalism. Uh, we use the word radical for lots and lots and lots of things, but actually, there are very, 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 very few radical arguments. And for me, this is a problem because it limits our imagination. The whole point of the radical project is, well, one, revolution, but two, to expand how we think about social problems, to reframe it, to really unsettle it. And when we misuse radical, and we apply radical to things which really, really aren't radical, then we lose that spirit. And one of the things which, I guess, most upsets me, I think, or most in terms of inspires the work uh, that I'm involved in, is really trying to say, well, let's go back to this radical politics. And if you think about 50 years ago, whether you talk about black radicalism, whether you talk about Marxist radicalism, even feminist radicalism, there was a time, there was a point in time, about 50 years ago, where there was, it, it, there was a debate about whether this political economy, the West, would actually survive. And there was a real time where this was an actual question. Will capitalism survive? That was the radical moment. And ever since then, we've become less and less and less and less and less radical. And so by pretending we're being radical and we're not being radical, we're actually further embedding ourselves into a system which can never provide freedom, justice, or equality for anybody, but particularly for black people. All right, so that's kind of the context, I guess, of the work. So what do I mean by radical? That would be a, a good framing to start with. What do I mean by radical? So to be radical, for me, there is, there is two simple, well, one simple thing, really. Radical means, uh, following Angela Davis, it simply means going to the root, right? It means really going to the root and rejecting basic principles of a society. Now, actually, we misunderstand radicalism hugely. In the, in the, what do we, what, what's the, in common media parlance, who are the radicals today? When they say radical, radicalization, who are they referring to? <laughs> who are they referring to? Uh, Islamic 
Yeah. yeah, Islamic State just collapsed. Right. Islamic State and ra radicalization. That's actually the worst use of the word radical you will ever find. In fact, radicalism and extremism are two completely opposite things. Not only are they different, they are opposite. Radical means you look at the roots of something, the principal arguments of something, and you reject them. Right. Extremism is the opposite. Extremism, you look at the roots of something, the principles of something, and you take them to their extreme. That's why it's called extremism. There is nothing more different than radicalism than extremism. So if you think about radical Islam, as Trump likes to call it, it's actually not possible. Because if you had a radical version of Islam, it would cease to be Islam. Right. You look at the roots and say, oh, I don't like this, and do something else. Right. And what the extremists are doing, the Islamic extremists are doing, they are basically taking the, the, the principles of it to its extreme. Like fascism, like white Christian nationalism, like white supremacy. There's a long history of this, and that is extremism. It really, really isn't radicalism. Also, in many ways, um, if you look at jihadism and that, and that, that, that extremism, it's kind of come into being and come into force because of the lack of radicalism. Right? If you look at somewhere like the African continent, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, and you, even there was a guy in an Islamic State, a French journalist, I heard the other day, I can't remember his name, but he was captain in Islamic State, and he comes out and, talk, and he, he's giving all his interviews about Islamic State, and he basically says, they're not really that Muslim. Like, they don't actually, they're not, people don't join Islamic State because they're fundamentally Islamic. They join Islamic State because it offers them security, offers them, it offers them to be part of, and importantly, it offers them a different, a, a, it offers them something different, right? Who is it in the world today that's saying we need to end the West? Who is it in the world today that's fighting back against Western imperialism, right? It's, you know, it really is in terms of violence, in terms of picking up arms, in terms of really rejecting, it is. The extremists. Now they're not doing it in a way which I would exclude. I would say it was a good idea. They're not doing it in a way which is, is progressive. But these are the people taking up arms against imperialism. And the people who really understand that they are under imperialism are the people who are under imperialism. Right? If you're in the African, there's a, there's a documentary by um, Professor Robert Beckford. I don't know if you know Robert Beckford, theologian in Birmingham, and he made a documentary. It's quite back. It's about ten years ago now. Uh, it's called The Great African Scandal, and he went to Ghana. And he's basically saying, how has the West destroyed Ghana? So the West destroys Ghana's uh, rice trade. So under Kwame Nkrumah, uh, rice boomed in Ghana because Pan-Africans said, look, we're going to reject any imports. We're just going to have internally grown rice. So lots and lots of rice farms, very, very well. The, the countryside full of rice farms. In the 80s, what did Ghana do? They go to the IMF and the World Bank, a.k.a. the devil, and they take loans, they, they take loans from the IMF and the World Bank so they can better irrigate their rice farms and compete with rice production. What's the actual result of these loans? Well, they have to do structural readjustment, they have to open up their markets, they have to open up their markets to foreign rice, and guess what happens? Rice production in Ghana collapses. So now you go to Ghana, very, very, very little rice production. And he's in the villages, and uh, in the documentary he's talking about how like, teenage girls are running away to go to the city because they've got nothing to do, etc, etc. Anyway, long story to tell you, what troubled him, and what I always remember from his documentary, is some of the rice farmers, former rice farmers, um, he was just talking to them, and he noticed that one of them had Osama Bin, Osama Bin Laden on his phone. And he's like, well, he's not even a Muslim, why do you have Osama Bin Laden on your phone? And his exact words were, He's the only one fighting back against the West. Right? He's the only one fighting back against the West. They know this imperialism is their problem, and they see this is the only people fighting against imperialism. And I guarantee if you go to the young people today who are being so-called radicalized, this is a big part of that argument. 50 years ago, they'd have been in the Black Panther Party. 50 years ago, in, in the African continent, they'd have been in any one of a number of radical, radical movements, radical organizations. Those have disappeared, and what's coming into place? Extremism. Which doesn't offer anybody anything, right? So basically, the battle for radicalism is a battle against extremism. Radicalism and extremism are two completely opposite things. So that's kind of the starting point. That's kind of where the book starts. So this is the starting point. That's just the framing point of the book. So how do we go back to black radicalism? And the story that opens the book is a March. There was a protest march in Birmingham. About 3,000 young people came out in the streets, and it was Black Lives Matter. And Black Lives Matter really is, you know, putting back racial injustice onto 
onto the um, agenda. In a way that it kind of dis didn't disappear, but it kind of disappeared a little bit. And now it's come back in full force, right? People are seeing that even though you have a black president in America, even though we have probably the best race relations legislation in Europe, at least in the UK, you still have significant problems with the police. The police in America essentially kill, kill black people with impunity. The police in Britain, you are three times more likely to die in suspicious circumstances by the hands of the police if you are black in Britain. And there are a number of people who've died recently in, in police custody or after police contact. And so young people, are, particularly young people, are seeing this and they're seeing the pictures of this and they're seeing it popularized and they're saying, I thought things had changed, what is going on? All right, so now you have this kind of re-emergence of black politics. And where the radical discussion comes back in, comes into this, is that really we do need to have a, a discussion of what kind of politics do we want? I mean, where are we going? What is the point? What are we trying to do? A number of times Black Lives Matter has been referred to as uh, the new civil rights movement. Well, I will make a statement and say that the last thing you need is a new civil rights movement. I mean, really, I mean, if you actually look at the civil rights movement, and uh, this is 100% borrowed from a uh, stolen, if you like, quoting from Malcolm X, uh, Malcolm really predicts all of the problems with the civil rights movement in 1963, right? Makes it very, 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 very clear. Says that this is a movement that is a liberal movement, it is a movement which is about reform, it is a movement which is about um, access, can you get black people into white spaces, and if you get black people into these positions, and if you get black people jobs, the system itself will open up and change, etc., etc., etc. That's liberal politics. Most of our politics fits into liberal politics. How do we redeem the system uh, which we're talking about, right? But Malcolm rejects this completely. And in fact, when, anytime anybody says that Malcolm is a civil rights leader, forget that. Nonsense. Malcolm was, that Malcolm was the biggest critic, critic of civil rights you would ever hear. In 1963, just a couple of years before he dies, the famous march on Washington, Malcolm calls it a farce. He says it's the farce on Washington. It's a circus with clowns and all. Hollywood couldn't have topped it. I mean, it's, complex, it's, just, it's just a joke. It's a joke. Why, why are we having this march? What is the point of this march? What does this march do? And actually, the march on Washington tells us the problems of liberal gains and the problems of the civil rights movement. So there's a book by um, Gary Young. Because I listen, Malcolm tells his story in lots and lots of detail, and I, I always want corroboration of this happened. And this book by Gary Young called The Speech tells it exactly the same way. So Malcolm was 100% right. March on Washington was supposed to be, they've been talking about the March on Washington for years and years and years and years and years. It was a grassroots initiative. The people were talking about lying down on the um, tarmac of the, of the airport, of shutting the city down. It was going to be angry. It was going to be a, a proper full-blooded protest against the state. Now what happened was, the powers that be, Kennedy, one of the powers that be as well, got, in, got wind of the march on Washington, these plans. And they, had, they went to the big six, the civil rights leaders, um, Martin Luther King, um, A. Philip Randolph, there's, there's more, Whitney Young. And he went to them and he said, look, you need to stop this march. This march can't happen, we don't want this march. And their response was, we can't stop it because we didn't start it. There's nothing to do with it, right? There's nothing to do with it. So instead of, so because they couldn't stop it, the, what the powers that be did, and this is all true again, and he's really spoke the speech, they basically funded, they gave them money, they gave about a million dollars to the, the big six civil rights leaders and said, okay, you can't stop it, but you can sanitize it, you can control it. And as soon as they get involved, they start to control it. They organize the speakers, they, they actually stopped James Baldwin, who was never really that radical anyway, from speaking because he would, he, would have, he would have gone off the script. They really, really meticulously said, look, you went through all of the speeches, you can't say this, you can't say this. They made sure it was uh, interracial, it was a mixed march. Um, they planned everything to the last detail. They even, they even, you couldn't even take your own science to the march on Washington. They actually handed you science and took away any science you took with you. It was all stage managed. You marched from this place to this place. It was time, the, the cameras came in. And at the end of it, the big six civil rights leaders met with, met with um, Kennedy in the White House and it was a photo opportunity. This is what Malcolm's saying. This, this is, what was the point? What, what is this? You took something which was, which was radical, it was grassroots, and you modified it, changed it, molded it, because the, who is the audience for civil rights? It's the powers that be, it's the state, right? And if it's the state, then you have to do things in a particular manner, and you are limited 100% by what the state sets out. And Malcolm was saying this is all wrong. This is the, the, the audience should be the people. It should be the grassroots. It should be the people on the street. And this is what civil rights can't do, because civil rights is always trying to get 
competitors would be. So Malcolm was very, very critical and said, look, this, is, this isn't going to lead anywhere. This is going to lead to compromises. It's going to lead to you effectively what will happen is, and this is what has happened, <coughs> is a few of us who are kind of towards the top of black people anyway will get a few jobs. You'll open up a little bit. You'll get some representation in that sense. But for most people, it's not going to change. For most people, it may actually get worse. So a quote I always use from Malcolm, he says, uh, America cannot provide freedom, justice, and equality for black people in the same way that a chicken can never lay a duck egg. It's just not meant to happen, right? We're talking about systemic inequality. That's a radical argument that says that these things that we see, the police shooting black people, uh, education inequality, um, three million children dying in Southeast Africa every year, and that's the, every year like this last year and this year, that's not a because the system doesn't work, that is because the system does work. That is what the system is supposed to do. If you analyze uh, racial capitalism, you'll find that from the very, 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 very birth of the West and from imperialism, what has been the key, <laughs> what has been, what's been the consistency? The black life actually does not matter. The black life is worthless. It's worthless in 1492, it's worthless today. That is, the unifi that is one of the unifying principles of this system. So why on earth are we expecting it to be any different? Can't change, right? That's the radical analysis. So look, it's not going to change. The things that we think that we see happening are a product of a system functioning perfectly well. And once you take that argument, it means you have to transform how you understand things. So one of the things that's going to get me in trouble in the book, because again, most of the book, most of the book actually say that this isn't radical, this isn't radical, and actually there's a much more radical argument behind this. And I don't know if any of you come across um, critical race theory. Well, critical race theory is a perfect example uh, in a book what I call liberal radicalism. Right? It's radical in theory, but in practice it's not radical. Right? So what does critical race theory do? Critical race theory is based on two premises, which when I read them I was like, well, wow, I've read this before, Malcolm said this 50 years ago, but let's pretend it's new because it's an academic, an academic book. But two basic premises of critical race theory, permanence and racism. So racism is a permanent feature, it's not going anywhere at all. Right? Permanent, permanence, of racism and the failure of civil rights. So actually, civil, critical race theory really comes out of civil rights lawyers, people who argue for civil rights legislation, who wanted civil rights changes, and what? And 50 years later, what did they find? Desegregated schools in 54, and in 2017, the schools are more segregated than they were before 1954. Right? You bring in um, legislation around uh, lack of discrimination. And then you find that, and this is, this is, this is from Kiem, Kianga Imata Taylor's excellent book, From Black Liberation to Black Lives Matter, where she unearths these terrible statistics. Do you know that in New York, half, half of all black people who have jobs, who are employed in New York City, work in fast food restaurants? I mean, just think about that for a second. Half of all black people who are employed in New York City are employed in fast food restaurants. It's about a third in Chicago, you see this in, in, in big ways, right? And this is under a black president, right? This is under a black president. So you see you've got this kind of representational progress, you've got legal process, progress, you've got affirmative action, and you have 50% of black people who are employed in New York who work in fast food restaurants. What kind of progress are we seeing? You actually look at the statistics, you find there's basically none, right? There's an emerging middle class, there's token integration, but Look at poor, the lives of poor black people in America are probably worse today than they were 50 years ago. Because now you have mass incarceration, which didn't exist 50 years ago. Right? And a million black men every year go to prison. Five million more are under state supervision. I mean, if you look at the crack academic and the drug academic, the violence, in many ways it's probably worse today for poor black people in America than it was 50 years ago. And if you look at how poor people are, it's about the same. Nothing's really improved. Right? And you have a black president. Right, of all things. So, this is the point of the radical argument, and particularly the point of a black radical. They say, well, let's, let, let's rethink, let's reset. If we are going to have this movement that says um, the black life has to matter, that says that we're going to have protests and we're going to, well, what are we going to do with this movement? What, where, where are we going? What are we trying to achieve? Because what we've done so far should tell us the very, very small limits, the very limited progress that we've made. And the UK is not really any different. In many ways, it's not different, right? So you have black, black studies. You, I couldn't have the job that I had, say, 
<laughs> she's, he's lucky enough I have the job I have now. <laughs> so in that sense, you could say, well, look, I have things are different. You've got black studies, you've got black academics, blah, blah, blah. But it's just the same thing you see in America, right? Some people get in. And when I say this to people, like, honestly, if you're unemployment for black men of my age, African Caribbean, in Birmingham, is about 50%. 50%. You are more likely, you are far more likely to be unemployed than you are to get my job. It's not even a point, you're not even pointing pretending to a young black man from Birmingham that you can have my job. Because the honest truth is probably not going to happen. Right? The honest truth is that's just very, very unlikely. Right? There's space for some of us, there is not space for all of them. So we have to radically rethink the politics. Also, what's important about when we think about the black radical tradition is how do we. How do we frame the actual political discussion and the debate? So, the first three chapters really the book are about nationalism and the nation state and how the nation state completely restricts how we think about all of our politics and where we are going forward. Right? If we draw this imaginary border, which makes absolutely no sense around, around the British Islands, I mean, you could, if, is, it, is it in theory possible to have some kind of equality in the UK for black people? It's like we're only, what, 3% of the population, maybe. Actually, if you look at the numbers, it's not it's really, really not possible. But you can make it better, right? Probably. But that's the problem with that whole nation state framing of the argument. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, my family's from Jamaica and England. Um, do I when they when, when my grandmother migrated into the UK, did I just lose all that connection to Jamaica? I mean, did it disappear? Did it go away? Do it, what black radicalism does particularly is it centers this connection of blackness. This is actually blackness is about the diaspora. Because the black is a country. It says that the, the way that we look, in a sense, um, the texture of our hair, that's it's not important because of race. It's not a race argument. No, I won't go into tech too long. But it's not if you ask any questions about race, uh, ask afterwards. But it's, it's, it's very different than race. It's about saying, well, look, this, the way that we're marked is important because what it tells us about our history and our location, and two, more importantly, it tells us that we have to be connected or should be at least connected to those who look like us, who those who are in the diaspora. This international basis. Black radicalism has always had this international basis, international analysis. When you apply international analysis, then basically most of our politics make no sense. Right? So, on two levels. One, this is something I deal with all the time. Why do you talk about Malcolm X? I love Malcolm. Why do you talk about Malcolm, Malcolm, Malcolm? Aren't there any British people you could talk about? What does that even mean? Like on a real level, what does that mean? How do I go with it? So there's two ways to think about how, what is it, black British people. Who, do you, who, who is the most influential black British person of the 20th century, do you think? Who is the most influential black British person of the 20th century? Write some names, anybody? Can't say any Henry. No. <laughs> 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 oh, the most influential black British person of the 20th century by far is Marcus Garvey. Marcus Mosiah Garvey is the most influential black British person of the 20th century. <coughs> Jamaican people don't like him, you say. Right, he's Jamaican, hang on a second, isn't he Jamaican, etc. Et but let's think about Garvey. I want, one, Garvey is probably one of the most influential people who stop in the 20th century. Garveyism, I mean, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, five million members across about 50 different countries. A hundred years ago, before internet, before there was no social media, there was no tweeting, and he managed to build this massive organization, biggest black organization, one of the biggest um, civil, uh, civic organizations ever, really, massive organization, printing, etc., etc. In terms of pageantry and organization, it's massively influential. Uh, in terms of the African liberation movements, hugely influential. So the red, black, and green of Garvey, it's not a coincidence, you see the red, black, and green dotted across flags all across the African continent. The Black Star in the middle of Ghana is from the Black Star line of Marcus Garvey. Hugely influential person. So one very influential in general. But Marcus Garvey was, was British. Garvey was born in 1888. And Garvey died in London in 1940. You know when Jamaican independence was? 62. At no point in Garvey's life did Jamaica exist. It didn't exist. It didn't exist. He was born and died a subject of the British Empire. When the US wanted to deport him, they deported him to where he said on his passport, subject of the British Empire. They didn't want to send him to Jamaica because they were afraid. They called revolution, so they sent him to Britain. 
This also happened to Claudia Jones, a Marxist who was born in Trinidad. Again, in the Britain, in the British Empire, and was deported to London. All right. So the way that we think about the nation is completely wrong. All right. This empire was the nation. I don't have to prove that there were black people in Britain in Tudor times to have a connection through my black side of my family to the UK. It's nonsense. It's absolutely nonsense. Everything that happened in the Caribbean was here. You know, we like to distance it and think about slavery as being, oh, there was West Indian slavery. It's nothing to do with Britain. And Britain ended slavery in the West Indies, apparently. Well, what kind of nonsense is that? What kind of nonsense is that? The West Indies was Britain. These were British plantations. You should actually see the the Caribbean and the plantations in the same way we see the American South. Because that is actually the relationship they had to Britain. All the wealth came from there, the money came from there, it poured into it. In fact, one of the reasons why Mar uh, Malcolm so influential in to, for British uh, scholarship is if you actually look at his journey and his family's journey, it's very, very similar to my family's journey from Jamaica. So what you have is you have a slaveholding part of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the nation, and remember it was part of the nation, which in British terms, it was the, the Caribbean, you know, excuse me, in America, it was the American South. And you have another part of the nation, um, which supposedly is more advanced and is more enlightened, and it supposedly frees the other part of the nation, the, other, the, the more backward slaveholding part, right? So in America, that's the American North, Civil War, Lincoln, etc., etc. And then in Britain, it's, it's, it's the metropolis, it's Britain, it's Wilberforce, etc. You can have, you can have that, you can even take the people, the characters in the story and say, Basically as well. And then what happens, slavery ends, there's emancipation, there's not very many jobs in either Caribbean or in the American South, where the people want to leave, they go to the places which they are told are more progressive, where they are told there are more jobs, where they are industrialized as well. They move from one part of the nation to the other part of the nation, expecting it to be better, but what do they find? They find cities where they're segregated, where they're attacked by the police, where they're discriminated against in schools, it's the same experience. The experience of my Caribbean family and the experiences of uh, Malcolm's American family, it's the same thing, right? But because we look at this national picture, we miss those connections, right? That's why Malcolm speaks to people in Britain today. It's, just, it's, like, it's the same process, right? And captures that very, 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 very clearly. And so actually seeing in that more, in that bigger sense, means that we have much more global connections and it changes the way that we, we think about things. When it also, things, when it also changes in, the metrics of your politics. Black radicalism is based on that analysis that says the system works fine, it's doing what it's supposed to do, and it's not going to do anything other, and also works on the analysis that says that we have to have a diasporic solution. So the, the things that we see here, or the things that we see in Kinshasa, or the things that we see in Kingston, um, these are what in the book I call them symptoms. They're symptoms of racism. Right? So we suffer these symptoms, and they manifest, the symptoms may manifest somewhat differently in different parts of the world. But the disease is empirical. It's the same disease that we're all facing. And so therefore, to break that disease, we need to all come together across nation-state boundaries. The nation-state needs to go, effectively. So this is a really important part of black radicalism. The nation-state, as a unit of analysis, as a container of our politics, needs to be destroyed. Unfortunately, when you think about a lot of black politics, uh, a lot of politics in particular, I would probably say black <coughs> politics in general, the, the nation state has been a very successful container of our movement. So the nation state in, this, in, the, in the West, it will fund stuff, it will give you stuff, it will give you the parameters. It will always keep you dealing with the, the symptoms and never dealing with the solution. So there's many people, in, and, and, and this is where I want to get to in the book, because I'm not saying that these are bad things to do, right? There are symptoms we need to address. Police brutality, uh, violence um, in black community. You need more black affairs. So these are all simple. These are all important things to do. But if all we do is do these things, we're never actually addressing the disease. The disease is racism, and these are symptoms that we face. Right? In fact, one of the things I've mobilised in the book concepts is that what we're looking for, really, if we're honest with ourselves, what we're looking for here, and, and particularly in the comfort of the West, is we are looking for symptom-free racism. That's what we really want. Right? You want to get into a position where you have symptom-free racism. Like I basically have mostly symptom-free racism. What are the symptoms of racism that a black man my age would expect to have? I don't get attacked by the police, really. I don't really have any problems with the police. And I have a job, a very well-paid job as well, a right? secure job, which, like I said, 50% of black people in my position do not have that, do not have that job. I do not have that. I have perfectly good health as well, which is, a, which is a huge issue, 
Let you know. Well, um, not really about wealth. Wealth is an issue, definitely. But you know, security in that sense, right? So most of the symptoms I don't really face. I definitely face some of them. So you can't work in a university and be black and not face some of the symptoms of racism. But to be honest, and this, again, this is one of the bits that really get me trouble in the book. But this whole theory around microaggressions and this, look, I experience microaggressions. But if I experience microaggressions, I have to accept that's a privilege. That's a privilege. Like, you see, when, you, when you're black and you experience microaggressions, it's a privilege. Because I guess that what means you're not facing the more severe symptoms. In fact, when I said to my mom, I tried to explain microaggressions to my mom, and she just said, that's just being black. And literally walked up. She had nothing for me. <laughs> she had nothing to say. She said, like, that's just being black. All right? So I basically have symptom-free racism. And if we're honest, most of us, that's what we're looking for, right? We're looking for sim like it may act up occasionally when it gets when it gets cold, or if there's a problem, it may just arise. But generally speaking, we just want to not have the symptoms of racism. Do we actually want to deal with the disease of racism? I don't know. I don't see that in our politics very often. This is what the radical argument is trying to do: it's trying to make people unsettled, uncomfortable, and to really, really, really rethink. So if you make this global argument, and if you say that actually, what makes blackness blackness? What makes blackness radical? It is this connection um, of blackness. It is that diasporic connection. And it is very much saying that we have to be responsible for the least of us. And this is a contradiction which I, well, yeah, this is a contradiction which I haven't dealt with yet and I don't know if it can be dealt with. What is the West built on? So in the book, again, I'm very critical of the working class. Working classes in the West, if you look at the working classes in the West, they've effectively been bought off, right? They've been bought off bought off by sharing the spoils of imperialism. And really from the beginning, right? So even when working class did terrible labor, it wasn't slave labor, right? There was a difference between slave labor and working in the factory. And now the, those kind of terrible jobs in factories where you get paid no money, that's gone again elsewhere, and you've got other kinds of oppression here. And if you look at a lot of what the left the left are arguing for, it is just a bigger piece of the imperial pie, right? That's what social democracy is. When people say we need to go back to social democracy, my parents came to England under social democracy and it was more racist, overtly racist then than it is now. You colour bars in the unions, you couldn't get jobs, you couldn't get work. Going back to social democracy does not solve any of the problems of racism at all. Right? And in fact, you could make a whole argument that social democracy was, is built off exploiting the rest. Right? You get this wealth, you massively exploit the developing countries, and then you just share it out more fairly. Right? This is basically what I like Corbyn, but that's really what Corbyn's arguing for. How do we share the wealth of imperialism more fairly with people who are in the nation state? Right? What was that saying? Um, yeah, so this is the contradiction. So that's the contradiction that, that we can't face. So 50 years ago, like I said, when my, when my parents came over uh, to the UK, we weren't part of that thing. We were very, very much separate from that outside of that, locked out of it. We couldn't have access to that. But now we sort of can. Not fair access, it's not, it's not equal, but we have some access to the, to the spoils which are driven from the exploitation of those of us outside. And the example I use often is um, in my family there was recently a, it wasn't even a family, it was a family friend. Their child died in a car accident. And two years later, we're still, the families are still trying to get over it, right? But in some parts of the world, children die all the time. Right? The fact that child death is so alien to us, like it's just completely out of our experience, is a privilege. Because as I said, three million children in Southeast, that's just Southeast Africa, die per year. A child dies every 10 seconds because they haven't got access to food. It just doesn't happen here, right? So we are protected, and now we actually are protected in a, in a, in a bigger way, right? I am just as guilty and just as complicit in exploiting those dead children as anybody else. And so are you, right? This is a contradiction which I don't know how we necessarily do, but it's a contradiction which is important to place. Because what our politics should be, if we're saying that our politics is about the least of the diaspora, then that means you have to argue politics for those dead children. This, you can put it as simple as you want to put it. That's what our politics is about. So that kind of moves away from microaggressions and black professors and all this stuff in the UK. Like on a real level, does it really matter? Like, honestly, I'll make arguments with black professors, but it's not, it's not it's a first world problem. It's a definition of a first world problem, all right? There are more important problems happening outside that we have to be engaged in. And if we're honest, we're really not. Even black lives matter. As there's a, in the book I talk about um, black lives matter and the smartphone. I mean, what is, that? What, what is actually the mechanism of Black Lives Matter? It is, it's this, right? It's a smartphone. It's that 
Black the police have been killed by black people for years and years and years. And that's like, that's the police love killing black people in America. Um, well, the difference is it's a smartphone. You can record it, you can put it on Facebook Live, and you can live stream, and everybody sees it, and, and then everybody gets angry about it, right? But how do we have these things? We have these things because we massively exploit the children in the Congo. We have to go down into the mines and, and then pick out the coal can for the phone, right? This, the fact that this is so freely available to us is our privilege, which explore, is based on the exploitation of Africa in particular. Like, particularly Africa. This is terrible for Africa. Terrible. So our actual social movement for racial justice in the West is, is built largely on the exploitation of African children. What is that? I mean, how do you deal with You have to be able to deal with that contradiction. And unfortunately, I don't have the answer for you, by the way. Unfortunately, <laughs> I, I, we, don't, we don't even think in those terms, right? So this is, again, this is the point of the radical analysis. Let's think differently about these things. Let's challenge our uh, status quo. And that's difficult for me as well. Obviously, like I said, I'm an academic. I get paid more than most people. Like, geez, you're top 10% in the country. Something. That's quite a lot. I don't get paid that much. Most people don't, people don't get paid that much. People don't get paid as much as they think they get paid. Um, so already, I'm in the top 10% earners in this country, which means I'm in the top like, I don't know, 3% in the world. Something crazy like that, right? That's properly elite if you look at this global level, right? So how can I make an argument about their children when really I'm just as bad, more bad than most people in terms of that exploitation? And this is a really difficult thing, right? And this is again why, how do we build that, um, that radical? Unfortunately, again, so I, spot, I met, had the, the luxury of meeting Angela Davis last year? Last year, I think last year. And I asked her, I said to her, look, I don't get it because this is, this is a perpetual struggle for me. How are you radical and an academic? How is that even possible? Because the university won is a racist, it isn't just racist, it is racism, as Deepa Deep Nayak tells us. Um, and again, we are very privileged. And, and America, jeez, I mean, American academics, I mean, I would literally pay twice as much if I went to work in America. I just mean, this is big, big money. American academics are rich. Angela Davis is, is actually like rich, he's rich. Top, we're talking about elite. Yeah? So how do you square the idea of being so basically elite in the West uh, with being radical? And you know what her answer was? Um, she didn't see the contradiction. Now, this is, I, I, don't, I don't see the contradiction. I, I was shocked. I was literally I was open man shocked. And the response basically was that because she works with people outside academia, that, that, that's where the, the radical nature of it comes from. And for me, that's, I don't know, that's, that's, that's the kind of answer we give when we become too comfortable. Right? And I say this in the book so I can say it on video. So. But that's why no one's in life. Don't you? No, 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 no one's in life. But this is, these are the kind of questions that we have to have to ask. And again, I don't really have an answer uh, for it. So, I don't know. Okay, all right, so one of the things I want to do, so the book basically goes through and says, well, what are the problems with radical politics? What's, what's radical, what's not radical, et cetera, et cetera. One of the issues which comes up uh, repeatedly is uh, misogyny. Obviously, you look back historically uh, through black politics and politics in general, but black politics probably more specifically, um, there has been this big problem of misogyny. In fact, we had Candice Allen, who was involved in setting up the first African American Studies department here in Harvard. She came to talk at the university a couple of weeks ago, and she just one of the casual stories she told was how, in one of the meetings, uh, one of the black women who they saw as being uppity was being a bit too loud, and someone just slapped her across the face in front of everybody. No one said anything. Just carried up. Moved up. That kind of level of violence and, and was just fine, it was accepted. And I've heard a number of stories like that in the UK. I've also seen and heard a number of organizations in the UK which do what we call what, what we call cultural nationalism. So the idea that you can save yourself by being more African culture. If you wear the shiki, if you do African spirituality, if you do these cultural things, you can be more African. Unfortunately, a lot of that being African tends to be patriarchal as well. So there's a particular version of the African family, women have a particular role, and you see this today. You see, I've been in meetings where the women literally would just get up and go and get, go and get the lunch, and then just come back and just, just bring it, and like, just serve it onto your plate. Like, it's fine, right? And no one says nothing. So there has been this strand of misogyny through black politics. Now, I think there's two ways to deal with that. One is, and this, so this is what I try and do with the book, is to separate out. So one of the things I say, cultural nationalism, that politics, is not right. It's actually never been right. It's never been part of the canon of work which I would accept as in radicalism. In fact, Ra, Maliwana, Karenga, Afrocentricity, that kind of movement, everybody knows about that. That was actually in open warfare with the Black Panther Party in the States, like proper warfare. They totally disagreed. They actually had gun battles with each other. Uh, the Oz organization killed um, Bonchi Carter, who was a young 
Black Panther. So actually, this, this, historically, this has not been the same thing. We've kind of conflated these things just because, oh, it's black people saying things, so they must be part of the same movement. But really, they're not the same movement. They're very, very different. Right? So there's lots of theory and arguments that will tell you, cool to nothing is bad, it's not radical, it's regressive. We can ignore a lot of that stuff. Right? However, even within the radical organizations like the Black Panthers, you can still see that misogyny. Anybody, if you read Elaine Brand's book, um, A Taste of Power, you see very, 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 very good. There's lots of misogyny, uh, lots of problems with um, sexual violence in the Panthers as well. Um, huge problems around the role of women, etc., etc. And Eldridge Cleaver. Eldridge Cleaver is probably the, the, the best example of the problems of, um, of misogyny in the Panthers. So if anybody knows who doesn't know, Eldridge Cleaver wrote the book Soul on Ice. You read Soul on Ice? I couldn't, even, I couldn't even finish Soul on Ice. It was so disgusting that I had to put it down. Literally just put it down. And one of the arguments, in one of the, the reason I put it down, he goes into quite a lot of depth about how he rapes white women and he's very proud of raping white women. This is one of the ways that black men can get back at the uh, white people. And then, which is bad enough in itself, terrible, he even then says, well, he practiced his rapes on black women. So he perfected them. I mean, this man's probably got mental health issues, really, but this was somebody who was welcomed into the Black Panther Party. I mean, the fact that people read that book and went, oh, that's fine, you're a celebrity, coming to the, tells you just how bad things were at the time. And so LG was welcomed into the Panthers, became part of the Panthers, uh, became a high profile member of the Panthers. That so does tell you there was a significant problem of misogyny. Also, however, as much as LG that is true, one of the things I like, one of, one of the ways you can get around, not around, but one of the ways you can deal with the misogyny with black, with black politics is also to give space to the black women who are in the movement. So, particularly black radical movements. And even Garveyism is problematic for lots of reasons. But there were five million people, <coughs> you had women in the Panthers. You had, you had women in the UNA, there were five million members. We only know about Marcus Garvey because of Amy Jakes Garvey, who actually documents his work, puts his work in a book, writes another book, Garvey and Garveyism. So women were hugely important in that movement. Of the Black Panthers, although there were problems, 60% of the Black Panthers in America were, were women. Right. Elaine Brown does actually become leader of the, the Panthers. And also, so it's about saying, well, look, let's, let's, let's celebrate the work of the women because a lot of that gets undone. Uh, in the British Black Panthers, it was mostly women. In fact, women led, Althea Jones and Khan, um, was hugely important, Colin Morris. Lots and lots of women's stories we just don't tell because we like to tell stories from these great, these great black men, or great men in general. Uh, and so when it comes to Elgis Cleaver, I actually, when I say Cleaver, I generally mean Kathleen Cleaver, because Kathleen Cleaver is way, way, way more progressive and way more to say than Elgis Cleaver. And actually, and it's one of the things, one of the most contentious parts of the book is I basically propose that Elgis Cleaver was an FBI stooge from the very, 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 very beginning. Right? And when I put this to my dad, who was part of the Panthers in, in the UK, he basically went, yeah, we all knew this. This is, this is everybody knew, like it was obvious at the time. If you think about what Cleaver did, um, it wasn't really about misogyny, particularly with the problem with it. was about, well, actually, no, it kind of was, right? It was, Cleaver embodied this hyper-masculine, this hyper-masculine form of blackness, which is hugely problematic in general, and has been hugely problematic in the movement. So Cleaver was, let's do violence, let's do guns, let's do this, let's, we've got to fight back, we're, we're men, this is where his rape argument comes into as well. That was Cleaver embodied that politics. And, he knew it was problematic, definitely, but he was trying to get to a better place, right? And he was saying, look, this is problem, this is bad. We don't want that. That's not, we need to d play down the misogyny and play up, actually, the survival programs, the free schools, the, the, health, the health clinics, the stuff that, in fact, basically, most of the work the Panthers did was providing free breakfast for kids, it was providing free health clinics, it was the Black Panther newspaper that had a huge circulation. That was what the Panthers did. This kind of Shoot at, shoot at with the police were very, that wasn't the Panthers. That was like this misogynistic view and hyper masculine thing which everybody drew on and people like Cleaver promoted. But actually, that wasn't really the work of the Black Panther Party. So, Cleaver kind of the, the state, Eldridge destabilizes the Panthers by really promoting that, promoting going after the police, ends up in a shootout uh, with the police. Uh, one of the Panthers gets killed and he ends up in Algeria, right? He runs away to Algeria and from Algeria basically splits the Panthers apart. Uh, saying they're not really revolution. So for me, Elders Cleaver is bad. Actually, if, we, if we just took Elders Cleaver out of the, of the radical canon, we would be in a much better place. Right? And actually, just replacing the Kathleen Cleaver, who's got, just got more positive things to say. One of the things that, that, that's, that's, what the, that's the problem with the misogyny argument. 
is that it misses, even if you just say it's black politics, black radical politics is misogynistic, you miss the point, right? Because women have been hugely involved in this politics. And it's about how do we go back, how do we re-engage, how do we pick up those arguments, how do we give them the place that they, that they actually hold, right? It's not even about revisionist history, it's about going back and finding that history. And also, again, just to, to, to push back a bit on the, the misogyny issue, is that there's authors like Hazel Carby who will talk about, well, talking about the nation and, and talking about violence and talking about revolution. These are all, these are all masculine things. <laughs> oh, oh, no, they really are not, right? If you think that violence is a masculine thing, that's you being misogynist. Right? I mean, it really is, right? Some of the people who pick up violence, pick up the gun, pick up the revolutionaries have been women historically. Nanny the Moon, like, one A favorite person of all time, obviously after Malcolm. He wanted to pick up the gun, but said, "Look, we have to defend and fight against these projects." Right? Haitian Revolution about a representative in the revolutionaries and the Haitian women. Uh, you go back even further uh, to Queen Azinga in Angola. Uh, you can go to a start a call more recently. The idea of revolution and, and overthrow. It's not a male issue. The idea that the nation state is a problem and needs to be rethought and needs to have revolutionary politics, that's not a male issue. Women, black women, have been involved in that politics for, I mean, for centuries. And it's about how do we put them back into the discussion. Right? We don't want to throw it all out just because of uh, some of the problems we have with you. history. All right, so I'm being told my time is up, so I'm just going to stop and let you ask any questions that you have. minutes or so for questions, so I'll just take one at a time to start with, so who wants to ask? Yep. So it's not a question, it's a thank you. I've been to anti-racist thoughts, I've been to anti-environmentalist, anti-capitalist, never once have I heard a male speaker stand up and talk about misogyny, and I want to say thank you very much for that. As a radical you. feminist myself. <laughs> so thank you. No, but it's important, right? I mean, it, I mean, if we're really going to say, look, how do we deal with the politics? It, it's a problem. It's a problem now. It's a problem with contemporary organisations. It has been, has been, remains on the left. And it's not just black politics. The left, it, it's the SWP, like it this. It's, it's a problem more broad. So it is something that has to be, has to be dealt with. And interestingly, if you look at, so Black Lives Matter is a, is a good example. This is three queer women who start Black Lives Matter, right? You really start that movement and engage in that movement. And that really is the history of black politics. Women have been hugely important in the, in the starting of things. And then, unfortunately, <coughs> uh, unfortunately, if you're honest about it, the politics has, has gone a different way. Misogyny has, has run. So there isn't an issue. How do we deal with that? So, so once you've pulled away all these, these problems that you, you've identified, so you the problem with misogyny and so on and so forth, just made it all out. Um, where do you get to? What, what's the once you pull it all back? What's, what's what does the book say? <laughs> so yeah, so, all right. no. so the point of the book is to be very much. It's not just a this is all the problem. It does say very too. There is a, there is a, there is a, a politics. Now I didn't mean to get to this. I thought you were. So what? The outcome of my so all this is so the PhD the book started as discussions in my PhD and the response to the PhD was we started the organization of black unity which so Malcolm X so when Malcolm X dies he starts an organization the organization of Afro-American unity you heard of the organization of Afro-American unity I mean this is really Malcolm's political legacy which is strange because we don't actually talk about it enough and lots of people will say we're the children of Malcolm even the parents will say we're the children of Malcolm but they ignore the fact that you know there's an organization uh, if you read the second founding rally of the OAAU speech, I mean, it says exactly how you set out the organization. It's not complicated at all, but no one really picks it up. All right, all right? And people misuse Malcolm to uh, just to stick out random bits and ignore the politics. So, as like I said, very, Malcolm is on the basis of my theoretical and practical work. We basically started the organization of that unity on the basis of Malcolm's organization of Afro American Unity. Um, so, what does that look like? So. Malcolm's basic, this is a quote from Stanley Carmichael, Kwame Touré, where he says, Malcolm's basic ideology is Gandhi's. Do I always talk about Gandhi? Because there's two real basic ingredients. One, is, um, one of them is ending the nation state. You can't have a nation state analysis, which means you can't have a nation state organization. So it can't be done through the state. The state is a problem. The state is equally a problem for 
the Caribbean or Africa, right? It's a paper I just wrote about Pan Africanism. Well, actually, I thought Pan Africanism was the solution. Then I read more about Pan Africanism. Well, oh, Jesus, that's, that's, that's a terrible, terrible history. And why is it terrible? Because of the nation state, right? The nation state really has been a container, particularly on the African continent, uh, which has kept people away from each other, kept part of each other, divided. And, and these nation states are completely fabricated. These aren't, these aren't nat natural states that are made up by the West. So one of the key ingredients to saying what's a black radical organization is it has to go beyond the nation state. And that's why Garvey, for all of Garvey's flaws, I wouldn't say Garvey was radical. Garvey's basically a capitalist and basically believes, basically, basically Garvey believes that Africans need to be like Europe. Right? Europe's great, Africans need to be like Europe. Right? Which is problematic. But if you look at the ingredient, the radical ingredient is the UNIA. Not a nation state, goes across all nation states, a black organization, um, it, it, they offer. They even they, they represent. They actually have they have the observer status of the um, League of Nations. Uh, it's all organised beyond the nation state. So this is what Mike Malcolm does in the organisation of Afro American Unity. They say, look, same basic principle. We all have a chapter here. You have a chapter in um, in Kinshasa. You have a chapter in Rio. And this the organisation has to be like that. And this has to subvert and overcome. Eventually, what you're saying is this should replace the nation state, the diasporic organisation. And the way the organisation theory works is you have a it sort of works like a government, so there's the Department of Education, Health, etc., etc., but it's grassroots up and it's not nation state based. Right? So that's really important. Um, and then the second part, what was the second part? The second part, and so the second part of that radical organization then is well, we're trying to create that organization across nation state boundaries, and it has to be independent. Black independence is really important, um, and fundamentally, what you're saying is that the physical return to the African continent is probably where you want to go. The African Revolution. Is do you you got to think this is this is where you can criticize the argument as being utopian, but we need far more utopian thinking. Right? One of the things I praise white people for more than anything is that you really have no limit to your imagination. Right? Like you just say, you say, well, this is a good idea. Let's just do that. Right? So, for instance, after the Second World War, the European Union is 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 is, is, is conceived after the Second World War. I mean, really think about it. Europe just killed everything. They literally laid waste to each other. And the European Union as an idea is conceived after the Second World War. If you told most people in Britain, Britain in particular, that 50 years from then, you were everywhere with unity, there'll be peace, and Germany, it will, it will be like the top, and they'll they laugh in your face. Right? But some people actually conceive this as an idea, and then so forth. So, so think of that similarly, you don't be an idea if you like, is really, you have to take yourself out of the world system. Africa is the only place to do that. Africa has, is the richest continent, although it is the poorest continent. Right? And that does mean coordination, planned economy, African, some version of African socialism. I don't have all the economic answers. But saying that's the question that we should be doing. How do you have a true revolution in the African continent? So you have those two, those are the two things you're trying to do. Global organization, revolution. And that's what the organization should be about. Right? And these aren't things that we are typically doing. So, going back to the question then, we actually started the organization of that unity in Birmingham. And all things you have to start small, right? Everything starts as this one little thing and then hopefully it becomes a big thing. And one of the things that we're doing in this organization is we actually put a booklet together, the power of the movement, pioneers of the fight for black liberation, which is 17 figures, men and women, uh, people you may have heard of, or people like, who would I know? Mboyana Handen from uh, Zimbabwe, who was really important in the 19th century fighting colonialism. So we put this booklet together and we're basically selling it for two bands each. And all the money goes to uh, the Marcus Garvey Nursery in Hansburg. And so what we're saying is you have to have a different economic model, you have to be able to be economic self economically independent, and you have to use that money to, to create this organization. So that's kind of a long answer for <laughs> the solution. But there, there is a solution, but it does mean thinking about things differently, and I guess being a bit, I'm going to call it utopia, but you talk about This isn't a crazy idea. 50, 50 years ago, when Malcolm was talking about this organization, the world was on a precipice of revolution. Like the African Revolution was a real thing. It could actually have happened. If we go along a different path in 50 years' time, well, this could happen, right? It could happen. But we have to think it to happen. That's, that's why the radical is really important. And if anybody wants to book it, I've got lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Y
the Wretched of the Earth, where he talks about the sleeping beauty of the world need to wake up. And he's talking about white industrial work, the Western work. And he really is wedded to this an idea. He's still influenced by Marxism. I think we need a politics that basically says, look, maybe that's going to happen, but it's probably not going to happen, so let's build a politics which doesn't, have to, which doesn't rely on that happening because it's probably not going to happen. But in terms of psychoanalysis, in terms of um, identity, in terms of saying actually blackness is a... Um, uh, how do we understand blackness? No, fairness, fairness is important. As one, uh, one of the concepts I do use in the book is uh, whiteness is a, a psychosis, actually, which is fanon in, fanon in, fanon influenced. Right, so actually whiteness isn't just an identity, isn't just an ideology, actually it's more than that, right? Whiteness is actually, if you're going to think about it, you have to think about it as being a psychosis. And when I say that in the sense that it, there, is, there is no rational basis to it. What is the point of whiteness? The point of whiteness is to delude people, and not just white people actually now, we also get delude into this, is to delude us into thinking that we're progressive, right? That this is okay. That the, the, the fact that a child dies every 10 seconds and we benefit from this is okay, right? It's to hide the fact that you have this extraordinarily exploitative system which we all benefit from, and whiteness gives us comfort to think that it's okay, right? That's what psychosis does in mental illness. You're actually mentally ill, but you're in a psychosis, so you don't understand your mental illness. Right? That's the point of psychosis. So in the book, I, I, I make this argument, and this is actually an article I wrote, which we made a film about, we made a documentary, um, <laughs> um, which we talked about this actually as a concept, you actually think about why this is psychosis, being completely irrational, being something you can't possibly engage in on any rational form. And I'll give you an example. So I'm actually going to, the, the film, the documentary and the, and the article was based on movies. Uh, the movies, Bell and Amazing Grace. I don't know if you've seen either Bell or Amazing Grace. You should probably watch them just to <laughs> entertain the folks. Um, and they, they, I mean, Bell in particular is this, this completely fabricated history. Bell's about like the one, maybe the one or two uh, black, black women enslaved. She's born a slave, um, but her father's an aristocrat, so he gets, she gets taken into this, this big mansion. This, this is a tr the story did happen. How they portrayed it in the film did not happen that, that way at all. But the story did happen. And, but they make all these fabrications to kind of minimize the idea of race and the director says she wanted to make this film because she wanted to give little black girls a Austin-like um, romance that they could feel part of the history. And, you know, this is slavery. I mean, why, 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 why would this be a good idea? Worst thing is, black woman directed it, black woman wrote it. All right, so psychosis of whiteness is not just about white people in any way. But the point I'm making in the piece, and more generally, is that these delusions are really important because they keep us away from really understanding our complicity in the system that kills children, to put it simply, right? And that's important because actually then why it's about saying that this, this psychosis is produced by the structure. It's not an accident, it can't go anywhere. Like, it's, it's there for a structural reason, to keep the structure alive, to embed us into the system. And therefore, if you want to get rid of whiteness, you have to get rid of the structure. You can't teach whiteness out. You can't rationalize it out. We've been on the right side of the argument for like 500 years. There is no moral way to change it. The only way to change it is to change the system. It's revolutionary change. So anyway, I don't know why I start to my fandom, but that's kind of fandom influenced idea. Yeah, I'm just gonna Thanks, that was very exciting as usual. Um, my question is not yet well formed, but hopefully by the time we finish it will be clear. <laughs> Just to, I was caught by your, your point on us wanting to live in a symptomless, symptomless, a rest, rest sort of a, a place where we have no symptoms of racism. And, stuff. and I wondered what you would say. Maybe you talked about it to us at the beginning, I must have missed it. I wondered what you would say about the rules must fall movement um, as a part of the radical radical black movement or resistance to colonialism and racism. One of what you would say about that. Um, look, again, it's, I don't want to say things are a bad idea because that's not the point. But if we're saying, is it a radical movement? That's a different question, right? So I actually wrote, I actually wrote the prologue for the Rose Must Fall book. So I'm very positive about, about Rose Must Fall. And also, like, if you look at, a lot of the agenda around the curriculum and stuff like that really is because of Rosemont School. Because it's Oxford and Oxford has a particular place and Oxford has a particular... You know, it got... Rosemont School got way more attention because it was Oxford. Like, if that was a Birmingham City University, nobody would care. Right? Nobody would never talk about it. 
So it, roads must all been really important in terms of putting that debate on the agenda, and then universities are probably not taking it that seriously, but at least they are addressing it in some way. Right? So roads must fall is an important movement. But if we were going to say it's a radical movement, we'd have to say no. Right? You'd have to. Same way I'd say is black studies a radical movement? Of course not. Right? Why not? Because the university, the university itself is as institutionally racist as the police force. I mean, it's, it's, the university is racism. The, the idea that I'm not a human being, where is that cemented and embedded? It's embedded in the university. Uh, racial science was practiced until just before the Second World War. Right? These ideas are hugely influential, and the universities are completely complicit. Um, I, always, so I always give an example, but um, Linnaeus University in Sweden, I found there's like a, there was a, a, a postcard came around about some research project, and Linnaeus University was on it. So I googled this to find out if it was the same Linnaeus who wrote System and the Torah in the 18th century, um, and it was. And in this book, part of the book, so he's a Swedish botanist, and he classifies plants, uh, but he also classifies humans in this book as well. And guess what he says about humans? He says there's a very clear chain of humanity. At the top is Europaeus albus, sanguine, white, governed by law. Then you have Americus rubiscus, uh, tanned and irascible, uh, governed by custom. Then you have Asiatic luridus, yellow, melancholy, and governed by religion. And then at the bottom you have Afro Niger, crafty, lazy, black, governed by the arbitrary will of the master. So this is a, this is a clear, not just a racist person, he racist theoretically, and his name dorbs one of the main universities in Sweden. When I told this story at an event last week, um, the guy in who's Dutch, Dutch, they actually have a Linnaeus Day. You know, they celebrate Linnaeus because of his great work in botany. It was crazy, right? Like this, this, these ideas of racism were actually literally embedded into the institutions we're talking about. And Oxford is a prime example. Cecil Rhodes is a prime example of that. Um, and so, actually, in the introduction, so in the in the prologue of this book, I, I wrote, "You can't decolonize a curriculum," and they kind of pushed back. Oh, well, hang on a second. What, what was the point? Well, how can we not decolonize a curriculum? But well, let's be honest. The bad is. If that's the institution that we are in, how do you ever have a decolonized group? Decolonized should be a radical move. And the only radical move you would do to someone like Oxford is to get rid of it. Right? <laughs> that's the only <laughs> radical proposal you could ever write. Right? So, is it radical? No, probably not. Is it useful and necessary? Definitely, of course it is. Hopefully I didn't get too much trouble. Yeah, no, no. It's, it's a good idea, but it's not, it's not right. Say that IMF is probably IMF and the World Bank would be the devil. Some of these corporations would also be the devil as well. And if you look at some of the, the mining of the, the phones, who's that done by? It's supported by the governments, but certainly it's not nation state. I think mean, also it's important to understand that. Um, so I do talk about this a little bit in the book. Is that this idea about globalization? That's, that's, that's a lie. That's a truth. 
That's a trick, right? What the West is built on global, and the West is a global system, has always been a global system, and these corporations have always existed and moved around the West. Dutch East in, Dutch East India Company, Dutch West India Company, uh, Lloyds of London, all these massive corporations. Have, um, I mean, it was a corporation that ran India for a year for, before the state, before British state even got involved. So it's really important to trace those corporations and say, actually, that kind of monopoly capitalism, that, that corporate capitalism has been a feature from the beginning. And these corporations have been just as complicit as a nation state as well. Right? So that, that's important, I think. And that's not a new thing, that's just a thing. So for example, um, if you look at Britain and France, Britain and France are nation states who are competing at the time in slavery, and they have comp they even fighting for each other's um, plantations, etc., etc. But French, about half of all the enslaved Africans who ended up on French plantation and French plantations were taken on British ship. So even though these are two competing nation states, French slavery cannot survive without British corporation. Right? So from the beginning, slavery, um, the West has been built on a level of cooperation between the West and the elite, which has largely been built from corporations. This is not a new thing. This thing continues, and you can just see you can just see it more easily there. But that's not a new thing at all. And these corporations, yeah, they have, of course, they have to go to right? Shell that owns all of Nigeria's oil fields, for example. Imagine that. Shell owns all of Nigeria's oil fields. Crazy. And that corporate responsibility thing, that's... Whiteness is a psychosis, that's all I can say. Go on. Yeah, um, I mean, I want to welcome what you say about the we being complicit. But I'm also worried by that, because if we're all complicit, then perhaps being complicit isn't such a bad thing after all, because it's something we all share. So how does one resolve that sort of tension between sort of admitting the complicity really quite quickly and quite simply, mm -hmm. and then actually so what? Because if we're all complicit, then my complicity isn't a moral failure, it's just normal. Yeah, that's true, I guess that's true. I guess that is true as well. You could say, yeah, 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 no, so you could just kind of wave up. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully you wouldn't, I would think. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's just more like, you know, are, are there things maybe to be said about sorts and varieties and degrees of complicity which would be helpful about rather than just using a blanket? I no, think, no, no. yeah, I mean, I don't I mean, I think, okay, in black, in black radical terms, no, actually, make, just making it straight is really important, making it, and actually one of the reasons why I would say Blackness, yeah, one of the reasons why blackness is radical potentially, and not necessarily, because actually oftentimes not, but potentially radical category, is it can cut through the complicity. So, if we all look the same, we probably would never, I never look, I never look, right? But this blackness gives me a direct connection. You say, if I look in the mirror, it's a connection. And that should hopefully allow me to cut through some of that, to really feel responsible and part of this bigger diaspora. And I guess the argument I'm making is that what we need, the, the, the solution is revolution. The solution is, to overcome this system and to come out of it. And that solution will mean I'll lose them, obviously. I ain't going to benefit from this. But it's that connection to the diaspora. Which is why, which is, and I, I don't have an answer because I get this question a lot. Okay, what do white people do? I don't know. I, I'm saying, look, this is a route that we, because of history, because of that, and because of that, we have this and we should embrace it. And that can be a revolutionary form. But I think you're right. I think just to say we're complicit could easily become, oh, yeah, yeah, we're complicit, let's move on. And that probably, well, that's what happened, probably, right? And actually, so then we give some money to modern slavery campaigns. We, uh, you know, we donate to the Red Cross and things like that. And that's a solution. That's, that's also a solution. Um, career. The problem, but, that, but that, again, I think is why I, I don't have any faith that the Western working class will wake up. And I, I, if I'm honest, I probably have very little faith that black people <laughs> it will wake up either. I mean, we just, we just have a route and a history that potentially they could do. That. But I don't know if I have enough faith. Okay, I've, I will ask one. I'll ask hopefully I'll think more. Um, how do you see the relationship between some of the, on the one hand, microaggressions and also smaller acts of resistance like attempts to get more black professors and so on, and the bigger structural issues you talk about? Is, for instance, a campaign to get more black professors just a way of co opting energies and diluting struggle, or are there ways in which they could become, if not a radical act, at least sort of part of a wider radicalism? Um, so, I mean, excuse me, I think, I think my, look, my progressions are important because in terms of that connection, what gives me that, it's not just the fact that I look black, 
is all the fact that I experience racism. Right. So I experience racism, and it don't matter how you, you can correct or wrong experience racism. It's not the most powerful person in the world. So actually, that experience of racism is important. If we're saying we want to build a collective, actually picking up those experiences of racism and saying, well, look, you can go as far as you like, you're still going to get this racism, is really important in terms of building that, that collective. Whether you should then mobilize against, I don't know. I just, I mean, I just don't know what the, what, the, anything that integrates us more into the system is a bad thing, right? And, black, and more black professors get you more into the system. So it's a bad thing, right? As I again, I run it for me because I will surely be a black person, right? So I can easy, easy for me to easy for me to say, right? Easy for me to say. Um, I don't know. Actually, it's tricky. It's tricky because on one hand, I want to say, yeah, this could be part of a radical project. On the other hand, if we're honest about those movements, they're not. Like, they're really not. They are representative. They are about how do we get, you know, how do we come to, them, how do we become more middle class? Um, I know a lot of black academics, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Um, mine is not a very intellectual question, I'm afraid, but what I'm really interested in is the doing, right? Mm -hmm. And you said that you've opened the nursery in Hansworth, yeah. and I'd like to know a little bit more about that initiative, basically. What, what, what is it about the nursery? What, what happens there? Yeah, so the nursery isn't open. The plan is to reopen the nursery. The nursery is the oldest, potentially, or maybe one of the oldest Latin nurseries in, in the country. Um, and what, again, what we're, what we're so, this is like what does radicalism look like? There is, the African Revolution is not happening tomorrow. It's not. It's not if I say let's go back to Africa, that's ridiculous. That, that's not, that's not going to solve anything, right? We have to say, well, how do we build stuff here? You have to struggle where you are, right? Uh, in that struggling where you are, you have to, and that's, I guess that's the point. So, in that struggling where you are, you have to address the symptoms which are facing you. One of those symptoms would be a lack of black professors. One of those symptoms would also be in terms of um, huge problems in terms of employment, etc., etc., within the black community. <coughs> so, in terms of the nursery, what we're saying is that actually having our own independent institutions, that's kind of what the politics of black relatives is about on a big scale, and that should be what it's about on a small scale. Right? How do we have our own independent institutions? And really importantly, how do we take control of education? I think this is tied back to the better answer to your question, would be how do we take, education is really, really, really important. Right? Education is how you spread these ideas and get people engaged and mobilized and moved. Unfortunately, what we have in this country, and most other countries, is a school system, it's not an education system. And the school system is to de-educate you. It is to turn you into something which fits in and molds into the system. So I guess the, the argument about a black professor is, Positive? No, not in itself. So we have black professors as positive. Uh, black studies professors could be positive. Critical, ra more radical ideas in academia, that would be positive. Because then you say, well, actually, we're disseminating this knowledge, which is necessary for well, black studies schools, the science and liberation, in order to promote and move and gain people into this politics. So one of the things that we want to do is to have a black studies and a more critical black studies that runs from nursery to university. And actually, kind of overcomes these problems of the school system to say that it's really important to educate kids, but it's really important we give them a black education. And nurseries, we may as well start a nursery work. So nursery, nursery is really important to do. So one is about really saying, well, let's use resources, let's provide resources, let's, um, let's um, have stuff in the community. So the nursery is used for nursery, but the plan is also to use it as a community hub as well. That's quite important. But also there's quite an important uh, educational idea behind it. But actually, you can, you can have black studies. A critical, potentially radical black studies. And I say potentially because I'm not sure we've dealt with the contradictions that run from the nursery to, to uh, wherever. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I think, I, I just, I, I think what's, what's troubled me mm -hmm. is what you've said about um, the black professors thing. Okay. Right? That, <laughs> just to declare, I'm a black lecturer. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> one of two in the law department and it, 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 it troubles me because I actually think there is something quite valuable about having black professors and I hear what you're saying about it actually sometimes just being about elevating to middle class and that sometimes you do get a kind of mentality of I'm not there, see you later yeah. I, I hear that right but I do think there is something in the fact that as a black lecturer, 
I can bring something to certain studies that maybe some of my white colleagues can't. And there is a value in that as far as disseminating. Whether that's radical or not, there is a value in that. So, um, but what I'm interested in is as far as the notion goes, what does that curriculum look like? Because I think that even if it's not something, you know, if it's just in that one space, but there's stuff that other people could take out. Like there might be things that I might want to yeah. My niece or my nephew, or do, do you see what I mean? There might be wider applications yeah. of that. So that's what I'm. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, I think, I mean, I think uh, this one is black. Yeah, again, <laughs> I don't, I don't think it's again. I'm not necessarily a bad thing. I just don't. Is it a radical thing? It could be. Uh, it could not. As well. And I always think I become professor. That's why I'll probably become professor relatively soon. Who does that benefit? Benefit me. Let's be honest. Benefit me. I, be, I benefit from it. Does anybody else benefit from it? Yeah, maybe. But really, probably not. Or maybe, oh, but that's if we, and that's this is why. I guess this is this is why. I guess this is why to go to the black. So this is why we started black study. We say, well, actually, we can do something different in this space. So and actually, one of the, the model that, and again, this is means this could be a contradiction which can't be radically overcome. I say radical is important. Um, I always wonder whether I should even be an academic. This is a, con this is a con concept. I'm like, actually, if I, if I follow the logic of most of the things I argue about, I probably shouldn't be. An Probably makes no sense. I suppose to leave academia immediately and go and do something else, which is probably true. And what's the reason I don't? Money. We should tell you it's a bad reason. Anything you do with money is a bad reason. But that's again the contradiction which I find myself in, right? Because if I leave and go and do the organisation, I'll be broke. Who wants to be broke? Right? So this should also tell us about the limits of the, <laughs> the movement. So one of the ways I guess I'm trying to justify it, I don't know if it will work, is. Within, look, we, we are in these institutions, we are here, and we can't really not be here. Um, if you look at people who do organization stuff, what do they, you have to eat. So what do you end up doing? You end up taking funding, you end up taking money from the state, and that's works. I mean, that, that just takes you down a route that you're not going anywhere in that route either. So I guess what we're trying to say with Black Studies is that can we colonize, that's how I put it, can we colonize the ivory tower? Can me being a professor give me access to stuff which I can then use for the organization and for to build that organization? That's kind of what I'm trying to do, is say that actually, but that does mean doing things differently. It doesn't mean being a professor in the same sense I would be a professor otherwise. It means teaching differently, engaging differently, using the resources differently, and, and, and creating a different way of being an academic. Um, and I think if we do that, that can then tie to the, to the radical movement as well. But I think, unfortunately, I'm not sure I see that that much in the we need that first time. Um, and in the nursery thing, I mean, the nursery, I mean, one of the things, why the Marcus Barbie nursery is really powerful is, I mean, you talk about nursery, so it's not, it's not like some massive educational program. <laughs> it's, it's about the images, it's about the books that you read, it's about the environment. It's just, and the thing which you will be surprised really, really stay with you from a younger age. So, um, I actually didn't like black, black politics at all for most of being young and most of being into, into teenager, and it kind of came back to it later on. But, it was actually the early years of experience of black studies, uh, of, black, of black education, and knowing things like Garvey and hearing our stories. When I came, it's, I don't think, if I hadn't had that, I don't think I'd be in there. Because it's just, it's just a different framework in which you, in which you, in which you do. So I think even just, just the books, the images, the, the stories that are being told, um, are really cool. So that's what we're trying to do in the, in the space, as we've done this and even things like the booklet. So actually one of the reasons why I made this booklet, this isn't for nursery kids, but we do want to make like more younger people focused stuff as well, is to make our own resources. And again, that's if you tie that as a university now and as a, I have access to stuff, we can do stuff differently. And if we're using our resources in the institution to be those things, then that, that can be. Um, thank you. Um, Especially that today racism is rampant on, on different grounds as well. Do you know if you just example, yeah. Yeah. So where where does solidarity figure in this project? Yeah, I mean the black radical tradition has usually been a tradition where you find that solidarity. Once you make an argument about about imperialism, about blackness, it's not just black people, Jesus. Of those child that dies every ten seconds, a large portion of them are in Africa, but a large portion of them are elsewhere, Asia, particularly India. China, uh, other parts of the world. So understanding that's really, 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 really important. 
Um, if you look at Malcolm, uh, Malcolm, Malcolm talks about the, the global revolution as much as he talks about the black revolution. And this is one area where I would disagree somewhat with Malcolm. Is Malcolm's at a time when that third world movement was a, was a possibility, and, and you know, China and all this, etc. Et Unfortunate reality is just because people are white, it doesn't mean they won't be anti black. That's just the reality. Right? And we can see that in many, many ways. China may end up being worse than Europe and Africa in the long run. Right? So, the idea you could just build a solidarity at that right? And so there is this, uh, what is uh, Kwame to a before, before, before any group can join, can join the bigger movement, they have to have, have unity inside, we collect it, right? And that's one of those say, black people, why would you even want black people to be part of your movement? Because black people, we ain't got nothing. Like literally, we got no power with nothing, right? What, what, are we, what are we doing? If you follow this logic of the African Revolution, what it says is the African Revolution is important. It's important to have that power base. And you don't stop there. One, the African Revolution would 100% end capitalism. Capitalism needs Africa, it needs to include Africa. So that destabilizing force would then, would then link up. So actually, basically what it's saying is this is important for us to do, to build, and it's important in doing that to have those solidarities. But really, you can have proper solidarity when you have real power uh, for, for the African, for black and African diaspora. And then you can have real solidarity. Because at the minute, I can say I have solidarity, but I don't really mean it. I don't know why you want, or why would you want solidarity with black people? That would be the question that I would ask. Black people would apologize for this truth. <laughs> Got about five minutes if people have any last questions. In that case, um, I'm just going to have a map. We thank Hinder before decanting to the wagon and water.